is called Free Range Parenting, Reckless or Responsible. Uh, my name is Ellie Lee and I am the director of a research centre based at the University of Kent in Canterbury called the Centre for Parenting Culture Studies. Um, and I wanted first of all to say thank you to Claire Fox and Jeff and the other people at the Institute of Ideas for giving us the opportunity as a research centre this year um, to partner um, with the Battle of Ideas to programme um, some discussions, one of which is this. We've also programmed two that are taking place tomorrow um, during this strand of discussions about feminism. Um, and it's been brilliant for us to have the opportunity to do this. Um, I'm particularly pleased um, that we've been able to uh, organise this discussion here because I think of all of the um, topics or issues that um, strike us um, as part of questions around parenting um, and the wider culture today, um, the question of our children's independence um, and how best to develop their autonomy um, is obviously um, critical um, and it's something inevitably which is close to the heart of any parent, um, never mind um, academic research. Um, just before I introduce our panel who are going to help us uh, look at all of this, um, I wanted to just um, draw attention to an article which you might want to follow up on because it's really interesting, um, published in City Lab, the online um, uh, magazine, um, a couple of weeks ago, called Why Are Little Kids in Japan So Independent? Um, and it was a really interesting article. It says the following. They wear knee socks, polished patent leather shoes and plaid jumpers with wide-brimmed hats fastened under the chin and train passes pinned to their backpacks. The kids are as young as six or seven on their way to and from school, and there's nary a guardian in sight. Um, and this article is noting just the ubiquity and the normality of children at quite a young age um, travelling to and from um, school in Japan. There's an interesting comment uh, made uh, in the article. What accounts for this unusual degree of independence? Not self-sufficiency, but in fact group reliance, according to Dwayne Dixon, a cultural anthropologist who wrote his doctoral dissertation on Japanese youth. Japanese kids learn early on that, ideally, any member of the community can be called on to serve or help others, he says. And I just wanted to throw that thought out at the beginning because I think it's a really interesting one um, and a point that's often not raised in these discussions about the interaction between childhood independence and autonomy um, and the wider culture um, and wider norms influencing the way adults um, think about things. To take our discussion further, I am absolutely delighted um, to welcome uh, Lenore Skenazy, um, the mother of all um, free-range kids <laughs> and free-range parents. Um, so she's over from the US to, to be with us today. Um, people know she's America's worst mom, um, as well as being the founder of the Free Range Kids movement. Um, and Lenore is going to give us a mini lecture um, for about 20 minutes. Um, when I got 21, she's going to throw something at me, she promised. <laughs> <laughs> what we're then going to do is to take um, comments from the three respondents who in their different ways um, are thinking actively um, about some of these questions. And I am hoping that this discussion can be um, a genuine engagement and discussion about how we think about and address uh, this question. Um, so it's uh, Alice Ferguson who's going to go first in her response, who's the director of Playing Out, an organisation based, uh, based in Bristol, um, which, as the name suggests, is concerned with kids playing out, right? <laughs> uh, then Lisa Harker, who's the director of strategy, policy and evidence at the NSPCC and will be familiar to people um, from previous contributions to the Battle of Ideas. Um, and then Helena Goldberg, um, who is an associate lecturer um, at the Open University in Psychology, um, also the author of Reclaiming Childhood, Freedom and Play in an Age of Fear, um, and also um, notably wrote a little comment for Spite yesterday um, on a new policy document that was produced by um, some politicians, an all-party group, um, on children, um, which was published this week. Um, so I'm hoping we can bring that to the table as well. Lenore. 
well, thank you, Ellie. Thank you all for coming. Um, thank you for watching so much American TV that I can talk really fast and you'll understand my accent. <laughs> um, America's worst mom, or not, not that I Google myself obsessively, but as of 24 hours ago, I was there for um, 77 Google pages as America's worst mom. Pages, okay. Uh, followed by America's worst Mother's Day gift, which I guess is probably the same here in Britain. Uh, it's an iron. <laughs> okay. We don't want it. And also lingerie. Uh, that's for Father's Day. Um, <laughs> worst mother in America or not, I'm a mom. That means I spend a lot of my time talking to other moms. And a few years back, I was talking to my upstairs neighbor, upstairs 23rd floor. He's living in Manhattan. You guys don't have the same skyscraper thing going on here. That was, I, I really don't know London. Um, anyways, and she was turning to me and she was very upset about something that had just happened to her at Costco. Everybody has Costco, right? No? Yes? Costco. Okay, so Melissa was at Costco with her two little girls who were five and two at the time, and she was waiting to check out, and the lady behind her in line tapped her on the shoulder and said, excuse me, would you mind watching my little boy for a second? I have to go get enough tuna for Armageddon, because <laughs> that's how we shop in America. <laughs> um, and if you have Costco, you shop that way too. Um, so Melissa said, sure, fine. And that's what she was upset about. She turned to me and she said, can you believe she did that? I'm like, forgot the tuna. No. <laughs> I could have taken her baby, and she would never have seen him again. And I'm like, whoa, Melissa, that's why you're mad at the lady for trusting you? Mm-hmm. And everybody else had agreed with Melissa. I said, all right, would you just mind if we just do a little role play for one minute? And, and let's imagine how this would work. Okay, um, first of all, um, you would have to be a kidnapper. <laughs> uh, one of the few with two small children of your own <laughs> at home already. Um, but maybe you wanted the boy. Admittedly, you'd been going about your nefarious scheme with the rather low-yield process of waiting for somebody to give you a child <laughs> in public, but it's your lucky day. Okay, so all you have to do is now you have to grab the kid out of the cart and your own two kids, and then you have to go sidling through, excuse me, excuse me, pardon, as you say, I, excuse me, and, and, and you're, you're, you're not only leaving with somebody else's child, you are leaving your place in line at Costco. <laughs> That's insane, <laughs> okay? But it's the time. So then you get to the door, and I don't know about England, but in America, there's always somebody waiting at the door to see if you've stolen something. And, and if you have, in America, they shoot you. Uh, no, not true. <laughs> um, but yes, we're stealing that other child, and I'm supposed to be the baby. Shut up, kid. Let's go. All right, so finally, you're at the vast parking lot, and you're looking, and you're trying to remember where you're parked, and you're a little nervous because it's your first felony. And then finally, there's your car. Okay, you get the kids in. You shove them in. You give them their, their, their drinks and their snacks and their board books. And then you have to figure out, in my country, at, at a certain age, you have to turn them from forward-facing. They, they go backward-facing until a certain age, and then forward-facing. You didn't find out the age of the kid, so you put them sideways. And then you put on, you always had Disney on. Now you got to do Bob the Builder, because you got the boy. And then you put yourself in the front seat, and you gun it across state lines, never to come home again, now raising three children under the age of five without a credit card, <laughs> in an assumed name, in another state. And Melissa thought the other lady was Crazy. <laughs> so that's my whole question today. Who's crazy? The people who think that our kids might be okay for a few seconds in public without our eyes directly upon them, or those who think that our children are in constant danger? And I, I think you can know uh, what side I'm on. Um, but I wrote a column about this because I thought, what an amazing moment in American history. We actually don't think that you can go like this to your kid Oh, I see you eating pizza. Sorry. <laughs> I shouldn't have gone like this. See, terrible things happen when you take your eye off the ball. Um, uh, so I wrote this column um, because I was a newspaper columnist. Emphasis on was. Uh, lost that job. But anyway, wrote a column, expected to set the world on fire, and I got like three emails. One said, you're not crazy. I'm crazy for Skenazy, uh, my favorite guy who wrote to me all the time. Anyways, nothing happened. But then, a few years later... Our younger son, Izzy, age nine, and I have to mention my older son because otherwise I never mention him. <laughs> Our older son is Maury. Done. Um, <laughs> so Izzy, age nine, started asking me and my husband if we would take him someplace and let him find his own way home, someplace he'd never been before. And we had to talk about this, me and America's Worst Dad. <laughs> you never hear that. Um, <laughs> But we decided, yes, we're on the subways all the time. There's tons of people on them. Oh, sorry, subway is tube. Okay, got that? The tube. We're on the tube all the time. Sounds like we're being pneumatic. Um, and we decided, yes, um, he was ready, 
and we were ready. So one sunny Sunday, I took him to Bloomingdale's, which is like, it wishes it was Harrods, right? And, um, and I left him in the handbag department. And, and it was deliberate. I mean, he knew it was happening. It wasn't like, Mom! Mom! No, he knew it was the day. And um, I left him in the handbag department because you go outside and there's the entrance to the subway. So he went down into the subway and then he talked to one of those people you're never supposed to talk to. It's a man. <laughs> a male. And he said, is this the way downtown? And the man said, oh, perfect for Melissa. Um, no. The man said, you're on the wrong side. As he went over the right side, he went downtown. He got off at 34th Street, the miracle on 34th Street, 34th Street. Um, and then uh, he took the bus home, the slowest bus in Manhattan. And he came into the apartment levitating because he was so proud that he had finally done something that he felt was grown up, which is the great driving force of all children. They want to be big. Um, and I didn't write it about it immediately because it didn't strike me as that big a deal, um, had I known. Uh, <laughs> but after about a month and a half of telling people about this and having the other fourth grade moms say they were going to wait till their kids were a little older, 38, 39, <laughs> um, I asked my editor, should I write about Izzy's subway ride? And she said, yeah, sounds like a nice local story. <laughs> local story. Um, so two days after why I let my nine-year-old ride the subway alone, I was on every possible talk show, and you guys won't know the names, but I could just stun you. If you knew how important the Today Show was, I was on the Today Show, and I was on MSNBC, I was on NPR, which is like BBC. Anyways, I was all over the map, and I was being accused of being this terrible mom who didn't care if her kid lived or died, which is odd. It's like, well, I did have that extra son at home, remember Maury? <laughs> but, so I started my blog, Free Range Kids. Welcome. There's a free range idea person. Um, <laughs> I started my blog that weekend to explain that I love safety. I love helmets and car seats and seat belts. And if you invite me to a baby shower, the gift I bring is a fire extinguisher. <laughs> That's how like worried I am <laughs> about every possible thing. But once I started the blog, I started hearing from people all over the country about things that had been changing in terms of protecting our kids that I didn't even realize were going on because I was in Manhattan. Um, I didn't realize that parents were driving their children to the bus stop. Do they do that here? Yes. No? Yes? No? Yes? Yeah. Yes. OK. Well, then I got one up for you. <laughs> then there are some, and they, of course, wait for the child to safely matriculate from the car to the bus. Um, and then there are buses that stop at every house now. And there are parents who drive their kids from the garage to the sidewalk just to make sure that nothing bad happens, because there's like 50 feet. Um, and that's just getting your kids to school. Do you, do you call it by the same word? We used to say arrival and dismissal. Did you guys use, use those words, arrival and dismissal? And did you change them now? Are they now drop off and pick up? Oh, well, then this whole point will not be made on you. Uh, it's an amazing point in America. You have to trust me on that one, because suddenly, Kids are, there's always drop off and there's always pick up because the parents are always involved and the kids are like, you know, the FedEx packages. Um, but that's just on the way to school. On the way home from school, when the bell rings, ding, 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 there has been a line of cars snaking around the, the corner and down the block, parents waiting to pick up their children. Does this happen here or should I just like skip to point two? Oh, there's a child. Watch out. <laughs> Take her out. <laughs> right, right, right. You never know. And I hear terrible things about the people that the battle ideas. Um, so do you guys pick up the kids in cars? Is that a huge thing here? OK, well, in America, it's like this. They, there's somebody waiting outside with a walkie-talkie, and all the children have been gathered together, except the bus children, the children who nobody cares about. But the children who are beloved and are being picked up by their parents are in a room like this. And outside, a lady is staying, standing there. And up comes the first car. And she reads the panel that's written on the dashboard, on a piece of paper. And it says, Olivia. And she goes, Olivia's mother is here. Olivia, your mother is here. And they take her up, and they walk her outside and they open the door and they shove her in like Obama, right? And then off she goes. And then it's Davey, Davey, your mother's here. Jeremy, Jeremy, your mother's here. Oliver, your mother's here. And it's like everybody's coming and going and it's like they're snipers sniping and helicopters fucking and bombs exploding. It's like, get out when you can, get out. Come on, get out safely, please. God, I hope they make it home. <laughs> and this turns out to be happening all around my country and maybe all around yours in neighborhoods that parents moved. Why? Why? Because it's, nice it's nice and safe. So that was a surprise to me. Um, but because you get to a certain age and you start thinking like, oh, in the olden days we walked to school and it was up way, both ways, and um, you just think about 
everything is better as a kid, um, I wanted to make sure that something really dramatic had changed. And I found, <laughs> drink your water, um, the smoking gun. And that is, if you get the double DVD um, set called Sesame Street Old School, you guys said Sesame Street, right? How many am I holding up? Oh, wait, I can't do that here. Or I can do that here. I keep forgetting. Anyways, <laughs> can't hold up one. <laughs> um, anyways, if you watch the Sesame Street Old School DVD, you see kids riding on a tricycle without a helmet. And you see kids playing in a vacant lot, and they're balancing on beams, and they're going through one of those giant pipes, you know, without a homeless person there. It's a sort of straight shot through, and they come out on the other side. There's kids playing follow the leader, and the leader does not have a PhD in developmental psychology. It's just another kid. But before you see any of this, a warning appears on screen, and it says, the following is intended for adult viewing only and may not be suitable for younger viewers. <laughs> I'm like, that's creepy. <laughs> Okay, um, but the reason was that even Sesame Street, even public television, or whatever you call it here, your BBC, I get them all confused, um, can no longer endorse the idea of kids doing anything unsupervised. And um, I just didn't understand why. And so, as a reporter, <laughs> who didn't have a job, and therefore had plenty of time to research a book, I decided to find out where did that fear come from? How come my mom, who was a nervous mom, my sister is here today, she can attest, um, would let us walk to school and walk home, and she wasn't constantly thinking about us being abducted and killed. She made it back! Yay! <laughs> I told you I was safe. Of course, it's England. You guys don't know anything about crime. <laughs> we have to teach you. Okay, so where did the fear come from? Um, I'm going to whip us through four different things that I think are different today. The first thing we have to blame is the... Media! You can scream it out. Oh, you're so proper. Oh, no, we won't scream it out. Scream it out. The media! We have to blame the media, right? Because the media is to blame, okay? <laughs> you can turn on... This is, this is where you always see how old I am. You can turn on the TV. <laughs> what is she doing? <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> turn on the TV and flip a few channels, which is this, and you will always find the story uh, on the news of a child that something terrible happened to. And it will be on for weeks, sometimes months, sometimes years. Um, the only fact that we know about Portugal in America is Maddie McCann. Like, I ask people in America to tell me any other fact they can tell me about Portugal. And I say, can you tell me anything about it from the last 500 years? <laughs> Except for the Maddie McCann story. That's all they know because that's the only story that mattered to the media, the story of a white middle-class girl who went missing. Um, because that is the narrative that the news media look for. And then the drama shows, the crime st shows, take those stories and they mash them up like, like, like the birds who like chew up the food and then vomit it forth. That's what they do. They take these horrible stories ripped from the headlines and then they send them back and make us even more scared. And so a few years ago, somebody wrote to my blog and said, did you watch Law & Order last night? And I was like, no, I can't figure out my TV. <laughs> and she said, well, go ask one of your sons to illegally download Law and & Order. And um, there are too many laws. That was my last uh, session I was in. And, um, and watch it. So Maury comes into the scene, puts the Law and & Order on, and I watch it. And here's the plot. There's a little boy. He's nine years old. And he says to his mom, Mom, can I please ride the subway alone? <laughs> And the mother takes his cheeks. I'm like, I would never do that. And she goes, oh, my poor child. No, that's dangerous. And she's been knitting him, knitting him mittens and a beautiful scarf. OK. And he goes, no, mom, it'll be fun. It'll be safe. And I'm like, it won't be safe. You're on law and order. <laughs> Who are you kidding? <laughs> right. But finally, she relents. OK, my darling only child. <laughs> and so off he goes. And does he get to school alive? No. Yes, he does. Ha <laughs> ha. Does he get home? No. no. What do they find on the ground? Dead body. <laughs> That's a little graphic. They find, first they find the? Mitten. The mitten, because there were no empty swings available. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, so they find the boy, and I just, uh, I use this just as an excuse to show you a picture um, of how the media drives you crazy. Really, it's just an excuse to show you pictures. So this is the boy on Law and Order, OK? We all get a look. Boy on Law and Order. And that's my son. Oh my what a 
coincidence. Isn't that surprising? I guess you're not supposed to think of any person in particular, but that's how the media is driving us crazy, okay? From the news and the drama shows. Second reason we're driving so we're being so driven crazy is that, oh no, speech outline. <laughs> that's all it says. Um, is it <laughs> Well, I sort of know it by heart. Um, is that we live in a litigious society. And when you live in a litigious society, you start looking at everything like a lawyer and thinking about what ways could it possibly be dangerous. So recently, the uh, Consumer Product Safety Commission in our country is always issuing recalls. They recalled, this was earlier this year, 140,000 children's sweatshirts. Why? You're going to get it wrong. Guess why? Fire retardant. Fire retardant. Oh, that's no. That's not it. Um, that was wrong. But that was wrong in the wrong way. <laughs> what? Scratchy. Oh, boy. <laughs> it's like... It's head? Head through the hole. Head through the hole. These are like... Oh, my God. I like have to take notes. I have never heard any of these. The scratchy thing is really weird. What? Kidnap me. You know, I do have a T-shirt if you go on my site that says... Um, for children. It says, uh, don't bother abducting me, I'm a pain in the ass. <laughs> a, a, a slow seller. <laughs> All right, well, in my country, we've been, we've been trained to know that you're, you're supposed to say, oh, it's a, choke, it's a uh, strangulation hazard because of the strings. But that wasn't it. See, that was my um, surprise. The, the reason they were recalled is because the zipper pull on the bottom of one zipper out of the 140,000, had fallen off, posing a choking hazard. Choking hazard, which is interesting, because that would mean that anything that size was a choking hazard. So all pistachios <laughs> are off limits. And you guys have different money, but whatever your little money is, is off limits. And I guess buttons are off limits. And uh, certain berries must be off limits. But once you start thinking about things in terms of danger, everything looks dangerous. In Richland, Washington, the school district decided to get rid of its swings because they did a study. Oh, gosh, <laughs> you can always trust a study. And um, they found that swings were the most dangerous playground equipment. And I'm like, yeah, because there's no teeter-totters left and there's no merry-go-rounds left, right? So it's like first they came for the teeter-totters and I said <laughs> nothing, right? And the merry-go-rounds. And so you know that once they get rid of the swings, they're going to have to go after the slide or the jungle gym. I mean, they're just shaking like, oh, it's going to be you. No, it's going to be you. You're higher. So, so if once you start thinking like a lawyer, everything seems too dangerous. Um, the third reason we're so crazed these days is because of Oh, I got to hurry. Um, because we live in an expert culture. And an expert culture doesn't um, tell you that everything is fine. An expert culture exists to tell you what you're doing wrong, that you should be doing otherwise. Otherwise, all bets are off. And so I just got this month's Parents Magazine. You know, why do they never hire me to freelance? Um, because I'm always making fun of them. Um, Parents Magazine has an article this month, of course. Uh, where is it? Oh, 10 home hazards hiding in plain sight. Guess what number one is that's going to kill your kid? It's really scary. Huh? Youth. Youth. Youth? Oh, me! <laughs> you know, you got to do something to keep that reputation, right? <laughs> there it is. It's the laundry hamper! Oh, my God, number one. Clothing hampers. Why? Because they have caused severe eye injuries. <laughs> <laughs> How stupid is your kid? <laughs> Our patient's eyes were cut open when the hamper wire came loose from the fabric. They required emergency surgery, says Iris Kassam, a pediatric ophthalmologist, blah, blah, blah. So suddenly, this is off limits. They, they, they can come up with anything to be dangerous, and they can tell you how to do anything. And if you give me one second, I'll do it with you. Come up here. I'm going to show you. This is, this is a, the thing that gets me crazy about the expert culture is that they tell you how to do things as if you are too stupid to figure them out yourself. So now we're going to do... What am I, the kid? You're going to be the kid. I'm going to boost your confidence thanks to learning my hug how-to. <laughs> okay, a hug how-to. Trying to catch your little one in an embrace <laughs> may seem a daunting task. Okay. But hugging has more benefits than an expression of love. It boosts your kiddo's self-confidence. And then we have an expert. Hugs show children that they are loved and appreciated. Huh. Okay. <laughs> Not because it's something they did, but because they are. And then they, they quote the guy. Okay. The perfect formula? Get down to your little one's level. 
Get them. Like, it'd be a little one. <laughs> and wrap them in both arms. <laughs> I'm so glad I know how to do it now. I think I got it right, right? Yeah. Did you feel loved and appreciated? Okay, so there's the expert culture driving us crazy. And then finally, there's, of course, the marketplace. Um, and the marketplace knows that the easiest, I can't say dollar, what is it, quid? The easiest pound, pound to get from somebody is the pound from a new parent. And so I'm going to show you a couple of products that you must buy. These are... What are these? Frank? Oh, you, you read my book. You practically wrote my book. Right? <laughs> what are they? Not listening to Nancy. What are they? Gloves. <laughs> Gloves, right. The missing mitten. <laughs> now, these are, Nancy is in fact correct, these are baby knee pads. <laughs> because you decided to decorate the nursery in crushed glass. <laughs> Bad idea. <laughs> what are these? These are table toppers, okay? They are 18 disposable placemats, eco-friendly, except for the fact that they exist. <laughs> and, and, and what do they do? They provide on-the-go protection from germs, dirt, and cleaning chemicals on restaurant and food court tables. Whoa, wait a minute. Protection from germs, dirt, and cleaning chemicals. <laughs> so your child is in danger if the place is a filthy pigsty with yesterday's taco salad stuck to the table or somebody came through and washed it. So basically your child is in constant danger. And my very favorite object is this. Nancy, shush. <laughs> right. Close your eyes. Okay, what is this? I'd like to hear from somebody who doesn't know what it is. Just guessing. A rubber duck. Ha ha ha. Not a rubber duck. No, well, it is a rubber duck, but it is much more. It is the baby bathwater temperature duck, okay? You put this in your baby's bath, and you wait a few minutes, and then you take it out, and if the word hot <laughs> appears on the bottom, then you know that the water is hot because you couldn't possibly just stick your hand in there, and if you pull it out in a few minutes and there's just bones left... <laughs> And it sort of smells like soup, right? No, no, no. You are too stupid to figure out what is hot. Maybe you never had a bath before. Maybe this is really good if you never had a bath. But basically, all these products are telling you that you are too stupid, too cheap, too benighted, and your child is in too much danger to make it from one day to the next without buying something, reading something, enrolling in a class, or just giving up. So um, I'm going to give up at this point and hand it over to the ladies, and then we'll talk about how to get out of, uh, what should I say, this era. This mess. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Well, you know what? I'm glad I'm not a respondent. <laughs> anyway, Alice. Well, was, yeah, it's quite a tough act to follow, Lenore. Um, I was desperately trying to stick some jokes into my talk. Um, yeah, I mean, I think what Lenore is doing, has done, is actually really amazing, really impressive, um, particularly since she's done it all in her spare time, outside of her main job as a stand-up. Um, and, yeah, I got a job. Yeah, I'm joking! That's it, no, it's really true. Um, so, yeah, I probably consider myself um, a free-range parent, yes. in, you know, comparatively speaking, amongst the parents that I know. Um, I'm one of the first to let my children walk to school. I'm one of the first to let them go to the park by themselves. Um, ah. I'm probably what my school would consider our neighbourhood's worst mom <laughs> um, for that reason. I mean, I've had experience of... The first time I let my son walk home from school on his own, and it was all agreed, and it, you know, it was after a period of time where I 
um, had sort of trained him to deal with roads and things properly. He didn't come home on his own. The lollipop man walked him all the way home. Um, and it was just this sort of sense that I'd done something wrong, you know, a kind of implicit criticism of my parenting. Um, but I haven't, you know, I haven't given in to it. Um, but I think it is very, very difficult for parents nowadays to kind of make their own judgment about things based on their knowledge of their, of their own child and their, their judgment about what they've got to deal with. Um, because we are so bombarded by judgments from the outside. And, um, and I think as parents, we're particularly vulnerable to criticism and to feeling judged. Um, and almost <laughs> that can override your own, your own uh, common sense or your own um, rationality about things. Um, I think um, there is a real problem. I don't think... Uh, I mean, I know there's a, there's a kind of philosophy that kids will be all right, no matter what, and they're, they're resilient. And I think they are very re resilient in lots of ways. But I do think that, that um, children's loss of freedom, particularly to be outside, to, to roam, to play out where they live, to get to places on their own, is having a big impact um, in all sorts of ways, particularly on their health. Um, children are far less physically active now than they were a generation ago and they're far less physically active than they ought to be for optimum health and uh, and we know that there's a big <laughs> obesity problem amongst children now and all of that is um, partly caused this isn't just me making this up this is um, there are lots of studies now showing that children's loss of physical activity is linked to their loss of freedom um, and that their and that obesity is known to be linked to a loss of physical activity. So um, there is a real issue there. There are obviously all sorts of other things that children are probably missing out on um, through not having that experience of just being out and about on their own as much as uh, my generation was. Um, I think... There's a real distraction going on when, um, as Lynn always says, the media focuses so much attention on parents' role in what's happened to children in childhood. Um, I actually think we need to look at this issue in a, in a sort of whole society way. Um, we need to look at the environment that we've created and how that lends itself or doesn't to children being able to be outside and independent. Um, Roger Hart, in 2002, wrote about New York and, coincidentally, mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you've read that. So, that but, MacPad wasn't free range yet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but he's writing about the physical environment and how that has actually changed <coughs> to the extent where children have almost been designed out of streets and designed out of public space. Um, and sometimes that's happened in quite an intentional way. Sometimes you'll go to a public space and there'll be signs up saying, no children. No, they don't say no children, but they say no skateboarding, no play, no this, no that. And the, and the subtle message is children aren't really that welcome here, and particularly children on their own are not really that welcome here. Um, but more often than not, I think that designing children out or pushing children out of public space has happened um, unintentionally. And it's just a result of not having really considered their needs, I think, more than anything. Um, I think the main point I want to make is that, yes, there's an issue with the media and paranoia about strangers and all those other worries, but I think we're in danger of ignoring a really big, obvious... Um, kind of physical barrier to children's freedom, which is cars mm -hmm. and motorised transport in general, um, having completely changed the physical landscape that children have to contend with on a daily basis. So um, that's my main point. I think uh, parent. well, we know from studies, so recent studies just been published um, by the Policy Studies Institute in London, looking at children's freedom and independence to roam across a whole range of countries um, in Europe. And one of their main conclusions is that 
the main barrier to children's freedom is parents worry about traffic. So it's not, it's not stranger danger that's the main uh, concern for parents. It is cars and traffic, and that's a much more rational fear for parents to have than, than the worry about them, their child being snatched off the, um, off the pavement. Um, it's rational because child accident, accident statistics are still way too high. Children, it's the number one cause of child deaths, apparently, is being hit by a car still. Um, children themselves say that they don't feel safe to be out and about in their neighbourhoods, often because of cars and traffic, and they don't like crossing certain roads because it feels unsafe. Um, so all of that stuff is, is known but for some reason, we just don't seem willing to kind of really face it and address it. Um, we're very much in love with cars in this society. And I think as adults, we need to kind of really question that and look at it. Um, and I think there's overall been a bit of a general acceptance that, well, the world's changed and this is children's lives now and it doesn't really matter. They've, they can still go to places. We'll take them to places. They've got other things to do. They don't need to be kicking about on the street. They don't need to be getting to the park by themselves. Um, they've got so much else on offer. They can go to the, you know, the youth club down the road or whatever. But, um, but I think... I mean, I, I feel myself as a parent, and I know from talking to lots of other parents, that um, it, it's not the same, and that all those activities do not compensate for children having that experience of, of finding out for themselves what it's like to, to be in a neighbourhood and to, um, to experience things for themselves, to encounter risk um, and all those experiences. Uh, have I got... Let's Do I need there. to wrap up? Yeah, let's okay, stop there. I'll stop yeah. there. But I've got I've got solutions yeah. as well. I think some there. About, um, <laughs> why this matters and whether it is um, changing the way children now end up is um, a, a really important area for us to look at. Lisa? Um, well, I'll be brief because I want to get on with the, the discussion, but and I loved your book. I really loved it and laughed all the way through. If anybody hasn't read it, you really write like you speak. I mean, it's, it's, it is a hilarious read. And, and I want to thank you for... Um, adding another word to my kids' vocabulary. So I work for a, a children's charity which is set out to end child cruelty. So whenever I refuse my children their third ice cream, they say, but mum, that's child cruelty. <laughs> um, and now they're going to be saying, you know, but mum, you like free range, you know. So thank you for that. Yes, uh, <laughs> um, I wanted to make three, three very quick points. Um, the first is that you, you know, you in the book, you acknowledge this as well. And we all know that parenting is a very messy business. There is no instruction manual that you can write. There's no way that you can uh, put down in law how to bring up your kids. Every child is different. They change all the time. You're constantly weighing up how much freedom to give them, when to rein that freedom in. Um, it's, it's a constant judgment call. And you can't, you can't put it down as an instruction manual. Um, the, de the danger with uh, any book that's in the parenting space is that it, it contributes to dogma. It contributes to an idea that there's a right and a wrong way. You're either free range or you're a helicopter. And, you know, we all move between those two worlds with our children all the time. And um, I think it's really important that we avoid the impression that there's a right and a wrong way of bringing up our, our kids. Um, and it's, it's essential that we have a more nuanced conversation that says... You know, we have to weigh this up uh, for ourselves, and that's you know that's the job of parenting. The second point is uh, is what I, what I think your book is really about, which is about our understanding of risk. Yeah. Um, you know, and our warped understanding of risk, and that warped understanding of risk is true for adults as it is for children. So. Um, you know, I live in Oxford. I came on the train today. When I, when I looked at, across the platform on my way, I saw the, the stairs going up over the, uh, the tracks. And on every stair, it says, do not run caution. You know, and there's 30 stairs, you know, as if you don't get the message after the first few. Okay, right. 
<laughs> exactly. <laughs> Kill yourself. Why don't you? Um, you know, and every, you know, if you go to uh, somewhere, you, you go and wash your hands, it says hot water, you know. <laughs> like, you know, you might be surprised the hot water comes out of a hot water tap. You know, we've seemed to be obsessed with naming very small risks in our society. And this is creating a very warped view of what exactly might happen to you. And it's a thing that adults have got to address as much as kids or, or parents. Um, and our understanding of risk is, um, is hugely out of proportion. So as, as, as Alice has said, I mean, stranger danger is not a big risk to children. Uh, children are much safer, uh, or they're much safer today than they were 30 years ago anyway. Uh, and we keep saying that NSPCC, although nobody likes to report that bit of the conversation. Um, but, the, but also the risk from being from a stranger in the park is tiny. Um, but, you know, parents are keeping their kids at home and letting them play unsupervised on the internet, where the risk of being bullied has actually increased quite considerably because bullies are less visible on the internet and if you have no idea what your children are doing on the internet actually you know you're leaving them more exposed to danger than you are if you let them go to the park you know and we've kind of got this strange uh, inability to weigh up risks uh, in a kind of balanced way and I think it's a problem that adults have we've got to start there and my final point is is about parenting and how competitive it is and how judgmental it is and how again how we've got to avoid books like this increasing that competitive spirit you know I'm a free range parent no I know you're not uh, you, have, you don't have to avoid that book <laughs> no <laughs> um, but I think it's a real barrier to progress because um, again it kind of contributes to this idea that there's a right and a wrong way it it means that the, the there's a, as a parent you have a sense that um I'm being judged by other parents. So you, you hear parents say this, you say, oh, I would send my child to the park unsupervised, but I'm a bit worried about what other parents might think. You know, you're not putting the interest of the child before your fear about how others might see you. Um, and it means that we are increasingly, I think, less empathetic about other people's choices and decisions. And for me, I work obviously in, in a field which is... Um, uh, about trying to tackle the worst forms of human behaviour towards children, child maltreatment, uh, a low risk, but nevertheless still happens in our society. The way that we're going to stop uh, children being physically abused or sexually abused or severely neglected is not by sending in social workers and police or even charities. It's about changing the behaviour in our communities. It's about us supporting each other in different ways. It's about challenging behaviour when you see it in your own communities. And yet we are increasingly scared of, of having those conversations. Uh, we talk about, you know, it takes a, a village to raise a child, but actually we all deal with our parenting troubles in, uh, in isolation of each other. And we uh, find it increasingly difficult to reach out and support one another. And I feel it very personally. I have, a, I have two adopted children who uh, you know, went through very severe trauma at the beginning of their lives. And therefore, their behavior has been very affected by what they went through. So I'm the, I'm the mum at the school gate whose, whose kid is really acting out, you know, who's really spitting and punching and kicking and doing all the things that you you really don't want your kids to be doing and you know you just feel the sense of judgment around you when actually what you really need is understanding and empathy and so I think the the real danger of the discussions around parenting is that we reinforce that sense of competition uh, and judgment rather than empathy. Okay thanks. Elena. Okay, uh, I want to pick up on this whole issue of trust, which is what you started with. I've forgotten the name of the... Melissa? Melissa, who lived on the 120-something yeah, floor. Because right. um, I, I often, um, you know, in the course of uh, dealing with my children, sort of stop and dwell and think, how did my parents manage? How could they be as brave as they were? Because the five of us, they didn't know where we were most of the time. We were playing by the fjord. We were allowed to swim in the floor, fjord, and that terrifies me. And just recently we were reminded of a story where my brother, because when we moved from Bergen, he was six, so he was young, six or younger when this happened, that him and my friend's little brother thought, 
why don't we borrow that rowing board boat they were by the harbour and set off out in this rowing boat. And this stranger thought the six-year-old should not be heading out to sea, so it pulled them back in. Wow. <laughs> and, um, it, it, you know, just thinking about that story, I think, of course, my parents are and were exceptional parents, mm -hmm. but that they I don't think necessarily they were braver than me. It's more that they had that trust in other adults. Mm -hmm. You know, that when two six-year-olds get in a rowing boat thinking they can head off to sea, you know, two years younger than my daughter, who's eight. Don't do it. No. <laughs> um, that there's somebody there who thinks, oh, right, I have to do something right, and, right. and, and um, uh, bring them back. So I, I think, you know, for our parents, if they had raised their children the way we do, they would have looked very, very strange if they walked us to school. I mean, we nobody walked us yeah. to school. If they organised play dates, nobody yeah, organised play dates. Yeah. But I think in, to go against the trend and try and give our children the type of freedom that we might have had, or somewhere at least approaching that, you have to be very, very brave and confident. I do think so, and you know, uh, um, I've got a lot of respect for you, Lenore, and you, you are a lot braver than me. I mean, oh, you God, say, you're, ta you're presented as America's way. worst mum, and you end up going on these TV programmes and defending yourself. I remember when uh, my daughter uh, tripped and fell carrying a glass bowl and ended up in A&E, and I'm questioned about where I was when this happened, yes. you know, and I'm mortified. <laughs> You know, oh, that's scary. intimidated. That's like they're going to take your kid away from you. Because, yeah. Oh, you're obviously an abuser. Right. Um, so I, I, you know, I do think you have to be very strong to 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 go um, counter it. And I, it, because you start, you said at the end that let's look at you know how we might change things. Mm -hmm. Because um, we're, we're recognising there's a problem, how might we change it? Now, I used to argue, I remember I think a couple of years back I was on um, BBC Radio 4 bringing up Britain, and I argued what we do as individuals doesn't matter. And that might have been just an excuse because I think, well, I'm not as brave as some of these parents <laughs> like Lenore, so it doesn't matter, it's not what we do as individuals um, because we need to confront the broader culture. I think I was wrong. I think, actually, what we do as individuals can make a difference. It makes a difference to our children's lives. It can make a difference to those around us in that it gives them more confidence. Like, you, oh, you're letting your son walk, walk to school. Maybe I should do that as well. And, you, you know, so you can start making a difference. But I do think it's very important to realise that that's not enough. We've got big, big barriers we've got to confront. Um, and in particular, I think, is the culture of distrust. Yes. Distrust in other human beings. And um, as part of that, this whole... Because that's what was so frightening to me, the redefinition of neglect. Yes. Um, the idea that I might have been targeted as a neglectful right. parent because right. my daughter had a piece of glass in her hand and where was I? Um, where were you? I, w I was upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> and she was downstairs. <laughs> Somebody else might say, well, where was I when she locked my, her older brother in the boot of her car? <laughs> as well. What? <laughs> Is there a cop in that? <laughs> <laughs> or when I had to fish my yes. son out to get anyway. Um, my kids are but, fine. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we have to uh, we have to confront the redefinition of de neglect, and we do need to have to confront the um, uh, uh, the level of distrust that uh, in other human beings. Um, and I wanted to because I. Just on the whole question of, like, is there a policy solution, yeah. which is what I uh, very briefly covered in the uh, spiked article yesterday. The all-party parliamentary group wrote a report about... All the, all the media picked up on them saying that children should play near cliffs. Um, Bad idea. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm terrified of heights, but yeah, but, but, no, there was a lot, of, a lot of stuff in there that I thought, this is really brave to say this, that, you know, they need to know to negotiate height, speed, um, uh, and water. And their deaths. Uh, <laughs> um, but also, I think that I really liked in the report, it said is that they need to learn to try and make friends themselves, so, you know, that we are, we are organising play dates, and, you know, trying to make friends and then maybe getting rebuffed and having to deal with that, which can be quite a painful thing. 
they might learn something from them. So I li really like that about the report. But when I started reading it, my heart sank because every chapter there was a list of yeah, recommendations. Kind of well, yeah. And it included things like um, Ofsted getting involved in rating how children are playing in the playground, the types of, <laughs> types of equipment they have in the playground. We need more professional training of parenting. Um, uh, blah blah blah, and I just think there there are there will not be bureaucratic solutions, no. um, and we do not need more advice to parents. Parents who think that somebody else out there, which I suppose is what you were trying to get across with that hug, right. you know, we don't even know how to hug our children. Somebody else out there has to tell us that it should be three seconds or right, whatever. Right, right. We need right. to be told how you know how to just behave like uh, human beings. Okay. But just to maybe finish off throwing in a little bit of a grenade, because <laughs> I was thinking, right, there isn't any policy solutions. And I thought, well, actually, there is. Policy solution is to get rid of policies. Yes. <laughs> yeah? And so I would say, here are things I want to get rid of. Anti-bullying <coughs> policies. I think anti-bullying policies breed distrust in that other children are damaging. Other children are damaging to you. Also, distrust of other adults. Uh, adults aren't capable of working out when something has gone severely wrong in children's relationships and maybe they have to step in and do something, and when it's like, that's just normal playground behaviour and I'm going to take a step back. They, the whole the p policy, this is a plug for my session tomorrow, <laughs> uh, so please come to that. But I think all of the policies are based on distrust of other uh, human beings. Get rid of them, get rid of loads of safeguarding measures. Doctors should not be told that they should be looking for suspicion of uh, abuse. And same with teachers, and legally, be legally obliged to report any um, uh, um, suspicion, suspicion uh, that they have. CRB checking of millions of people, and, and, and the, the anti-terrorism measures. A friend of mine, it was a th uh, um, deputy head at a school, they got a poor post, uh, Ofsted inspection based on two things. One, not doing enough to promote um, equality, because they're not talking about... This was an, a predominantly Muslim school. They're not talking about lesbianism to primary school children, so they're not doing enough to promote uh, uh, equality. Secondly... They're not doing enough to find out where the children, their older brothers and their parents, um, what they are doing in the holiday. Did they go back right. to Pakistan? If they so went back to, you know, stuff. constant suspicion, suspicion, suspicion. <coughs> Get rid of all of that. Because I don't <laughs> think the dis or any of these measures make children any safer and they actually make life very miserable. Okay. Brilliant. Thanks, Helena.